Greetings and welcome to the fourth National Adaptation Forum webinar, live from the California Adaptation Forum. Today is the second day of the California Adaptation Forum, which is addressing climate risk to all sectors in California. The forum reflects the diverse needs and challenges facing California and is providing leadership and insights about how California can most effectively respond. Mm -hmm. The National Adaptation Forum webinars are held quarterly so we can continue discussing on how to move adaptation forward. If you'd like to recommend a topic or are interested in per partnering and co-hosting a webinar in the future, please email me at alex at ecoadapt.org. Before we get started, I'd like to go through some basic housekeeping rules to ensure a successful webinar experience. Please place the telephone, cell phone, or computer on mute. This will help reduce any feedback. If you're using microphone voice over IP option, please ensure you place your computer on mute as well, even if you're listed as muted when logged in. We will have plenty of time for um, question and answers um, for our panel members today, and we will do our best to answer all of them. Um, please, um, you can submit questions through the question panel, and you can also raise your hands and we'll unmute you and you can ask questions directly. You can also use the chat function to report any technical issues or problems you might be encountering. The chat function can also be used to communicate between attendees, and it can be used as ways to emphasize a point heard during the panel discussions. Finally, I wanted to let you know that we will be recording the webinar today and posting the webinar in the Equidapt, CAKE, and um, National Adaptation Forum website. They should be available online next week and can be viewed at nationaladaptationforum.org. Without further ado, I will um, pass this on to Lara Hansen. Good morning and greetings from Sacramento where it's bright and early in the morning. Um, and we are live from the California National Adaptation Forum and it's Wednesday morning. Um, I have convinced uh, four other California Adaptation Forum attendees to join me here this morning um, and share their thoughts about what's going on and talk a little bit about what we're thinking are the really exciting things that are about to happen in California that Michael's going to make sure happen. Um, so first let me introduce our panel members, these brave souls who've woken up early. Uh, we have Kevin Orner, who's with NOAA. You have a new title, Kevin, would you like to share your new position? Sure, thanks, Laura. So I'm, I'm the Regional Climate Services Director for the Western United States for NOAA. Excellent. Uh, we have Will Travis, formerly of the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, in an emeritus position there now. Good morning. Thank you. Um, and we have Amber Paris of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Good morning. And we have Michael McCormick, who is the person who may be responsible for the California Adaptation Forum, having stood up uh, and proclaimed to a crowd of 500 people in Denver at the National Adaptation Forum that California is going to do one, too. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be here. Um, so I wanted to start off with um, three of the panelists who are here. Uh, Amber, Michael, and Kevin were all in sessions yesterday, and I wanted them to share a little bit about what happened in those sessions um, with those of you who are on the webinar who weren't able to be here in Sacramento. Amber, why don't you start? Great. Well, I think one thing that was really exciting to see here at the California Forum was that the thing that we love so much about the National Forum is how much everyone was in the discussions. It wasn't just a sit and listen session. People were really interactive and excited. And um, we did a panel yesterday that was talking about the key dimensions of adaptation success. What does success look like? And how do we as practitioners move forward in a time of uncertainty, a time when there's limited resources? And we had some really amazing conversations about trade-offs, about what does it mean when your project is successful but it means a failure for someone else? Is failure always bad? Um, and we had some also really interesting conversations about the importance of being creative, um, but then what do we do if everything speeds up and accelerates so fast that the planning and process that we've undertaken isn't really 
uh, isn't really viable anymore. So how do we respond to crisis mode without going crazy into crisis mode? So it, um, we had a very short sort of presentation, and the rest of it was just a packed room of people standing and sitting on top of each other, having an amazing um, interactive discussion, and we had to close them down and kick them out of the room at three, and people just continued to walk down the stairs and in the hallway. So I think that those just amazing interactions are not something that you see at every conference. We saw it at the National Forum, and we saw it again here, and I think that's really exciting. Yeah, Amber, I, you know, I think that's that's a, a pretty consistent uh, comment that we've been getting on the forum is that it's one of these, so we have 800 people here. We were really only planning to have between five and 600 folks, so the room design wasn't necessarily designed to accommodate that many people, but we also didn't want to, um, to prevent people from coming that wanted to be here. So I, I think... Um, I think it just shows the energy of the topic, the, the prescience of the topic right now, with everything else going on, uh, adaptation, resilience, preparedness. These are big things that need to be talked about deeply. You know, I, um, I was in a couple of breakout sessions, but I, I wanted to talk briefly about the plenaries. I, I found the, the plenaries particularly interesting um, as, as we tried to create a, a blend of different perspectives in the plenary sessions. And if you weren't able to watch those live streaming on the internet on CaliforniaAdaptationForum.org, uh, we've recorded them and they'll be posted to the website in the next uh, week or two. So you'll be able to go back and take a look at them. Um, but we had a, a business panel that's something we haven't necessarily seen at, at other uh, climate conferences in the past. And it was one of these opportunities to bring uh, leaders in business together to talk about what their organizations are doing on climate and how we as practitioners and advocates out there need to respond to, um, to, to the business interest in dealing with climate in the business case. So we had uh, Kish Rajan, who's the director of the um, Governor's Office of Business Development here in California, introduced this great panel with Joel Macauer, who's uh, the CEO and executive editor of Green Biz Group. And we had a couple of VPs from uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, Kaiser Permanente, and Wells Fargo and Company. And one of the more memorable comments of the, of the presentation was when Stephanie Rico from Wells Fargo at the end said, you know, bankers need to know that if you're going in to fund a project through a loan that deals with resilience and adaptation, they need to know that it's something that it's related to climate change. Because otherwise, bankers aren't going to understand the connection between projects that need to get funded and climate change, which is, is something that, that needs funding. Um, so being able to talk about that clearly and openly with, with folks that are providing funding for projects is important. Um, and Kish Rajan from Go, GoBiz, uh, he, he uh, I thought, made a really important comment about that the California economy is growing not in spite of climate policy, but because of it. You know, we. tech uh, regions within the country are all located within California, and that's a really uh, clear indication of uh, our innovation that's being spurred as a result of our climate policies. Um, I won't even talk about trivia night. You can save that for the interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so the breakout sessions, uh, I was in two of them, Vision California, which we brought together uh, leaders from within state to talk about how we're dealing with greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation and resilience at the same time. You know, people sometimes argue that if you're if you're dealing with adaptation and resilience, you're throwing your hands up and running away from from the real problem, which is greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And we argue that we have to be doing both, knowing that greenhouse gas reductions is really the best adaptation policy out there. The more we can reduce emissions, the fewer impacts are going to occur. And so we were trying to highlight um, the connection between adaptation and, and emissions reductions. And the other session I was in was uh, the Building Regional Collaboratives to Accelerate Success. And we have a really unique regional collaborative structure here in California that's allowing uh, some really great communication to occur between local governments, regional groups, and the state, and, uh, and also communication directly with, with our federal partners, too. And it's a really great opportunity to talk with folks that were interested in forming their own collaboratives. And there were some great questions about, um, you know, how do you fund them? What are the governance structures? How do you get people to join? And, and it was a great conversation. And like Amber said, you know, both, both of those sessions were filled to capacity, and people continued the conversation in the hallways after we left. 
Thanks, Kevin. So, um, good morning, everybody. And just echoing to Michael and Amber, the the sessions have been really um, full and interesting, both in terms of the number of people in the rooms, but also the content of the sessions. And it's, it's been a really um, interesting experience and worthwhile so far. Um, one thing that's really struck me is the diversity of, of the folks that are here. Um, I wasn't really sure who to expect to meet here, but there's been people from many different walks of life. And um, it, it's been a real powerful experience seeing and interacting with that diversity. So um, answering the question, the, the session that I was in was colorfully entitled Shaking the Couch Cushions, Understanding and Creating Funding Streams for Climate Research and Adaptation. Um, we had four speakers, um, two from the state of California and two, two feds, including myself. Um, and, and the session basically talked through what are the different funding um, programs out there for funding adaptation or, or climate in general. Um, and so there was a talk from the two feds about the various federal programs um, from all the different agencies. I, I focused on NOAA. Um, the other the other federal first person gave a nice overview of all the different federal programs from the different agencies and, and what their sort of motivations and equities are in their grant programs. And um, there was some really interesting discussion about how to how to leverage those equities to the local priorities that were represented in the room. Um, from the state side, there were a couple people that talked about the different state um, um, funding programs. Um, and, and in particular, there was, was some really rich dialogue about how, how do you sort of take traditional funding grant programs that are targeted mostly at academics and, and make those applicable to um, adaptation projects with state and local government, especially local government. And how, how do you, how can you partner with academics? How can you apply to grant programs that maybe you haven't even known about before? And how, how do you, how can you increase your chances of success? Um, so that, that was um, a really interesting session. Yeah, you made actually a really interesting point in that session where you uh, shared the fact that while people are always talking about how there's less and less money for doing uh, adaptation and climate research, um, that in fact the total number of dollars that is are being spent by the federal government on research has been going up, not in the climate space necessarily, but in other areas. So there's no reason to despair uh, that there will never be more funds to do this kind of work. Um, as the need and the interest grows, perhaps so will the money stream. Exactly, right. So I showed a couple of plots from the American Society for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, um, and they showed a time series of um, funding going back to 1970 for all sciences broken down by discipline. And as Laura said, the life sciences have realized um, a very significant increase, I think, on the order of tripling of their funding since 1970. And most of that, that increase happened in a relatively small number of years in the early 2000s, um, whereas the climate science and the environmental science funding has been relatively steady. So I, I think there may be sort of lessons learned there that um, the size of the pie is not necessarily um, constrained to be what it is today. And with um, I, you know, funding has been a consistent theme throughout the event. Almost every session has had to deal with it or if they didn't deal with it directly in the presentation, they got questions about it. Um, you know, we're in California, this week we'll be releasing a white paper on funding platforms for local and regional action around resilience and adaptation. Um, and it, it's replicable in other parts of the U.S. as well. Hopefully someone will pick that up at, at, as in the national audience and turn it into something that's valuable for, um, for maybe release at the National Adaptation Forum. Um, but we, you know, the, the Governance structures and how to get funding to local and regional efforts on climate is um, one of the real questions we're dealing with in California right now. Because uh, there has been funding for research, there's been funding for policy development, but when it's on the ground implementation, that's that's always the hard part. And so a lot of people here are talking about, you know, planning is great. You know, we've done a lot of planning for climate. Let's think next about implementation and how we get, actually get things done on the ground. So, Will, you weren't in a session yesterday, but you did attend many a session yesterday. Uh, was there something that you found particularly interesting in what you came across that seemed new and exciting or seemed, wow, that makes me feel like we always did the right thing? Well, it, first off, the fact that there are 800 people here, uh, it was not too long ago that the only way you could get 800 people to talk about climate adaptation was that they would gather together to protest talking about it at all because it was, as Michael said, an indication of defeat. Uh, I think also the 
the the fact that the innovation there is a discussion uh, around the table which is very rich because everybody is engaged as pioneers right now so uh, a lot of of really good discussions and as someone mentioned I think Amber that uh, it wasn't just talking heads we were having a very good conversation in all of the sessions that I attended I was particularly impressed by the financial people who were here uh, how do you not only fund what we think needs to be done but how do you make money at it and uh, I think successful adaptation will come at the point where we don't even notice we're doing it anymore just because of it will become a, a fact of life and uh, it's like uh, someone was explaining the difference between mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation is buying a Prius and adaptation is driving the Prius uphill away from the shoreline. Uh, and we just <laughs> won't notice it. It just becomes a part of life. So the, uh, the thing that most impressed me was the, the large number of people here and uh, the great variety of disciplines we're seeing. Anybody else come across anything interesting yesterday besides the sessions you were in? I think just that, you know, just to build off what Will said about the disciplines is something that's, I think, really new and unique to this forum that I really hope we can bring um, even bigger and better to the National Forum is bringing in um, climate change art and artists. And it first started out with this idea of um, the role of art in communicating climate risk and the role of art in helping us to build community engagement and hopefully resilience in our communities around climate change and, and being able to reach out to um, people that we might not yet have really inspired to take action. Um, and so there were several elements that were are here at this event related to art. Um, we had a really wonderful reception last night where we had several installations. Um, some of the artists were here to talk about their work and it gave people the chance to kind of mingle and talk and walk around and interact with the work. Um, we also, as as we were putting together, um, you know, bringing art into the event, it became very clear to me that my mind really shifted from it wasn't just about bringing the art here, it was about bringing the artists. And this is, you know, we talk a lot about building this network of practitioners and it was, and we really, I realized that the artists need to be part of our network of practitioners, that we all have these unique roles to play and artists bring something very unique to the table. So I think that um, because of that, we ended up having just a really phenomenal session yesterday where we brought in four different um, artists or those who are involved in the art community to talk about their sort of process, the work that they're doing, and <clears throat> excuse me, the response that they're getting from people. And um, again, it was this great dialogue about um, from people who hadn't you know, really thought about that, we're really walking away inspired to think about how can I work with an artist in my local community to communicate the work that we're trying to do. And maybe that's another caveat to communication. So I think that it's been, it's added a lot of richness to the dialogue and it's added something really new and unique. And <clears throat> we also had a really wonderful partnership between the Sacramento Public Library <clears throat> and uh, the Crocker Art Museum and the Discovery Center where it was all focused on climate, art, and youth engagement. And um, so we had a reception yesterday where the children actually came and they saw the work that they had created based on um, climate stories that were told to them over their summer camp. And the art is here displayed at the event. So this whole kind of multi-generation, um, I think is also really inspiring to see that all this work that we're doing, we're passionate about this work and we're leaving a legacy for this next generation of children. So I think that the, it brought a lot to this event and um, in a way that wasn't overpowering but really I think um, you know gave people a lot of inspiration and, and excitement so I hope that's something we'll be able to see also at the national event. Anybody else see anything unique yesterday that they're excited about or does anyone else want to reflect on the art piece because I do think that that's a very unique feature. Yeah, of, of yes this. I would like to. Uh, aesthetics has been described as the highest form of communication and um, I think we have thought of adaptation as a, uh, we can't continue to do what we've done the way we've done it in the past, so we have to compromise down and life in the future will not be nearly as enriching as it was in the past. And I think introducing art into adaptation 
uh, raises it to a new level. Uh, and aesthetics are so incredibly important. I, in the midst of this, I realized that uh, I'm in the process right now of taking a perfectly functional kitchen and spending a great deal of money on it to make it a perfectly functional kitchen that will look a heck of a lot better. And we do use and value aesthetics in all phases of our lives. It, it affects where we choose to live, who we choose to marry, what color Prius we get when we drive it <laughs> uphill. Uh, and introducing it into this conversation and, and making it part of uh, what we do, I think, is, is critically important. Uh, for a long period of time, I found that the, the, the new buildings that were being designed so that they had the highest energy rating and so forth, you had to explain to people why they were wonderful buildings. And now we've gotten to the point where we can just enjoy them for their visual grandeur. They are just beautiful. We've learned how to do this. And I think integrating art and aesthetics into everything we do is, is something very important to take forward. So uh, while art was a track here, I hope at the national conference it is the, the main theme. Right, and how can we get it even beyond the conferences? A conversation that Amber and I have had is how do you start creating public art that allows people to uh, experience the reality of climate change and reflect on it? Um, we've talked about can we come up with like sea level rise installations that allow people to sort of get that sense over time because much public art lasts for decades um, and you could in fact create public art that's part of the process of envisioning what the future will be like and figuring out what our path there could look like so that it's a positive outcome. Yes. Even if you abandon your Prius and simply walk up to it. <laughs> and I, I've really enjoyed the art as well. And I, I got to acknowledge Amber Paris is one of the first visioning uh, pieces of this forum um, as we were uh, talking about this. Because Amber was deeply involved in the National Adaptation Forum as well. Uh, you know, her insights into how what worked and didn't work there really fed into how the California Adaptation Forum was designed. Um, so we had a. Uh, um, we had some really fantastic conversations in the beginning about uh, how art should be engaged in the in the program, and so Amber ran with this this idea of art, and I I kind of unplugged from it, and then uh, a few weeks ago heard about all of, all of the work that had been done with Department of Water Resources and other state en entities, but also external organizations, and it's, it's an, an amazing convergence of organizations to support the art at the event and the discussion, and the schools, and the kids, and the teachers, and it really shows there's a lot of interest out there uh, to talk about it. Um, That's and what happens when you let me run rogue. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. You're a mapper. <laughs> um, but the other, you know, I think one of the other things, and almost everybody's mentioned this at this point, but is the, is the mix of attendees. Um, what, what we found, at least in California, is it matters less what you call adaptation, more about what you're doing on the ground, um, there were a couple of plenary keynotes that, that brought up different words as being preferred uh, over adaptation, and we've gotten some flack for using the word adaptation in our title. I, I mean, the main reason we did it was so that we could be an affiliate, affiliate <laughs> event of the National Adaptation Forum. Um, but, but there's also, you know, it matters less what we call it. There's business continuity planning. That's adaptation and resilience. We've got preparedness, resilience, safeguarding. We had the title of the new California Safeguarding. Uh, safeguarding California plan, um, adaptation, you know, there's lots of things we could call it, but really what you do on the ground matters more. And, and the people here, cross disciplines, cross sectors, are, are talking about actually what you do on the ground rather than how to talk about it, which is, I think, a really great transition from where we were a few years ago. Yeah, no one wants to spend another three hours picking the word that we will use to refer to what we're trying to do to deal with an emergency. Right. I guess just picking up on the theme of who's at this meeting that Michael just raised, um, one of the interesting things for me was that actually at the happy hour last night, and um, the art was definitely around and definitely a factor in sort of motivating discussion that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, but I was in a, a sidebar having a, sharing a drink with a, a, a financier who, who is here um, I asked her, why, why, why is she here? Why, why are you here? And, and, and she, her answer was that um, she didn't have to be here. She, she was just very intrigued by the agenda and just wanted to be here. And, and you know, her, her investment portfolio, her whole scheme is based on investing in um, 
renewable energy and, and green investment, and, and, and she wanted to come sort of learn more about that broader field so that she had context to go back and, and make her um, her financial investments more representative of what's going on in the field. Um, and I was, you know, thinking the whole time I'm talking to her that I, I don't think I've ever been to a conference with people that are, you know, creating mutual funds and, and doing that kind of thing before. So, um, again, the diversity of the people here is, is really interesting and something that I think is um, bears some consideration and thought about. How, how do you how do you leverage that? How do you how do you how do you distill or bring out conversations from the people that are here that maybe aren't part of the program or maybe you know are here because they're on here on a whim and, and they, they want to be part of this discussion and part of this dialogue. How do we bring that in and, and sort of you know learn from, from that? And I think that's one of the powerful things about these kinds of meetings that have been happening on adaptation now that are trying to be cross-sectoral um, because for a long time climate change was seen as an environmental issue. Mm -hmm or at best an energy issue. Um, and now it's it's a societal issue and it has to include all of society to get to good solutions to try and avoid as many of those cases where someone's great success story is at the cost of someone else. Um, and how do we get the, the good outcome as opposed to the bad outcome? And one of the one of the reasons we partnered with the local government commission uh, on this event is the state was really interested in, I mean, clearly we, we can't, deal with climate change as the state. We need everybody within California to be to be working towards our longer term goals um, to create the state that we want to see in 2050 and 2100. Um, so one of the reasons we partnered with LGC is they have this fantastic network of local and regional uh, elected officials and senior leadership and local government. Then they were able to reach out to them and bring them help help bring them to the conference. In addition to you know, our federal partners brought in some fantastic representation. Uh, we reached out to Bill Mackauer at Green Biz Group, so he had publicized the event through his business networks. And, uh, you know, it wound up, we had um, we had 85 different promotional partners that really crossed the board of representing different sectors and different topics. And so we were able to get a representation here that we maybe not wouldn't otherwise have had. Um, and the, the fiscal sponsors are really representative as well of this, this real diversity. It's 42 different sponsors that have supported the event. Um, and I think this is indicative of the mainstreaming of the discussion of adaptation and resilience. You know, it's something that um, is our longer term goal is we need to institutionalize and mainstream the discussion so it's not just policy wants talking about it. We need everybody incorporating it into their, their daily actions, into their business continuity planning, into their longer term you know, land use plans, et cetera. And I feel like we've turned a corner uh, over the past year or two uh, to the point where, where that's starting to happen. So we need to continue the initiative, continue the momentum over the next few years, and, and really get the mechanisms in place to make it easier for that to happen throughout the state. Uh, well, as we move forward to the, the national conference, uh, I think one of the challenges we, we're going to face is we have to realize we are here in California. We've got a governor down the street that gets it. We understand here in California that uh, adaptation is essential, that we need to have a strategy if we are going to continue to attract the investment to California that we want, that we aren't going to have insurers running away because of what they perceive as very risky places to build. And we're trying to get in front of that. I, I think as you take the conversation nationally, there are still a lot of places that uh, uh, I'll cite North Carolina where it's they deal with the problem by making it legal to talk about it. And so uh, the, the challenge for us as we go to St. Louis next year is how do we take advantage of the momentum we have here and advance the conversation so that we are beyond denial and are having a national sense that we're enjoying here in California today. Yeah, that is always a challenge. The diversity of the country perhaps ex exceeds even the diversity of California. <laughs> uh, one of the sessions that I was in yesterday that I actually thought was really interesting, it gets back to a point, Michael, that you were making about people actually doing the activities on the ground. I went to a fantastic session about agriculture that had someone from uh, a water stewardship group, someone from uh, the soil management districts, um, and then an 
a farmer. So you had water, soil, and crop. Um, and they were all doing actual things on the ground that were thinking about preparing for responding to climate change. And it was just very exciting to see. Um, so much of the climate conversation has been around creating frameworks and theory. And this was these were people who, for all three of them, I'm fairly certain that none of them cared one whit about any of the diagrams that have ever been created. Um, but they saw the implications on the ground in what they were doing and were changing the way they did what they did so that they could have better long-term outcomes, whether it was the California Agriculture Water Stewardship Initiative Resource Center, which provides tools so that people know how much water they're likely to have and how they can work with less water, um, or the Soil Conservation District, which has been renamed in California, which um, have uh, a lot of uh, plans on how to protect soil um, to allow crops to continue to grow in places where nutrient availability is changing. Um, to the farmer who's changing the way they they farm their crops. And it was just really interesting to see that literally in the dirt on the ground activity. Um, and there were a lot of sessions like that that were really very interesting. Anyone else go to one where people were doing stuff? Yeah, the, um, the regional catalyzation session I was in, um, somebody asked that in the audience of the panel. And uh, just for example, yesterday there was a um, the, the law was signed where all uh, re-roofs in city of LA now have to be high albedo materials because they've been dealing with urban heat island. They have uh, really great modeling on, on urban heat island and how um, extreme heat days will accelerate into the future as climate change occurs in the LA region. And so they were able to use the data that they have on uh, extreme heat to inform policy development around urban heat island. So now they're going to have uh, you know, cool roofs, cool materials in LA, and it's going to make it a much more pleasant place to be during the middle of the summer. Um, and now if we can just make them solar roofs. Well, but, well, <laughs> solar and high albedo, right? Um, so part of the challenge is that you know, land use is a local government issue, and the state is not in control of land use. Um, and what we can do is provide guidance, support, resources, uh, technical, uh, we can share case studies. Um, and I think one of the best ways we've, we've found to support that local action is through these regional collaboratives that have formed to, to, uh, to really represent local government interests within their regions. And we can uh, work through them much more efficiently through individual uh, jurisdictions. So I, and there were, there was a number of other examples as well, but, um, it, Oh, really, over the past few years, the, the shift has been to real action on the ground, and uh, it's great to see that there's actual traction there. Yeah. Anyone else? We have a couple questions from our audience. Well, I, I went to one session, and this is one example, but it is so fascinating to me, I, I do want to share it, and that is they were looking at providing improved flood protection at Miami Beach which was described as a speed bump on a hurricane on its way to Miami. Uh, in order to do this, they want to put in a new seawall. And they would build the seawall just seaward of the existing seawall, a foot seaward. And it will be 68 miles long. And in the process, they are creating real estate, waterfront real estate, that is one foot wide and 68 miles long. And it has a tremendous value. And that is what they will be using to finance the seawall. It just never occurred to me that you could do that. Wow. Anybody else? I just was just to add on to what you said about the work on the ground. Um, I think it's, it's so amazing and exciting, and it just fills a lot of people with hope. And I think that's what's really phenomenal about this event is that you're learning a lot, you're making new alliances, um, but you're leaving inspired and excited. And I think that that's, you know, we can do that for better. Okay, so we have a couple questions from people who are logged on. Um, one of them says, concerning the gap between research and adaptation, adaptation strategies, what kind of action or research um, do we think are missing from resilient adaptation in urban areas? Well, I think one of the things that's come up here a number of times is is the connection to 
um, uh, natural services and um, you know the connection between the urban and rural environment. You know, we have examples from around the U.S. For example, City of New York recognized the value of of their watershed in upstate New York, and so they protected it. Um, and uh, you know, we in California with our with our drought right now, uh, we're also. I, I mean, we've always been focused on our natural environment. It's always been a priority. But there's, you know, there's certainly a recognition of the value of our natural environments and supporting the urban environment. Um, but I think the connection there is is something that urban policy developers uh, are sometimes disconnected from. So if we can create a better connection between that urban and rural, um, you know, policy and program development to support ecosystems, I think I think that'll be uh, that'll be very helpful. Okay. Another question. Um, actually, part of it is a piece of information to share with us. Um, someone was interested in the conversation about art and aesthetics. Um, apparently, in Boston, uh, they just released a report called Designing with Water, uh, providing case studies on beautiful adaptive design. Um, and they're interested in knowing whether living with water, uh, which is promoted by the Dutch, um, has been part of the conversation at the forum. Uh, well, it, it has. Uh, we have the good fortune of uh, having learned from the Dutch, uh, and I will mention that uh, at the agency that I used to run, BCDC, we had a design competition uh, five years ago and uh, asked for ideas as to how we deal with rising tides, and we got 130 entrants from 18 nations, and a lot of them were uh, how we could incorporate living with water into our uh, aesthetic of the future, our planning of the future. And I, I think that the real challenge, particularly with sea level rise that we face, is the first reaction is appropriately how do we protect what we have now. And then the next thing to do is to realize that the shoreline is forever going to be moving inland and upland and uh, unwiring the hardwiring in our brain where we've always associated the words permanent and shoreline. And I think we're going to be in a state from here on of being having shorelines that are temporarily permanent or permanently temporary. <laughs> uh, and that too will have a, a whole new response. But And I think that the best way of learning how to deal with that is to simply put out a call for innovative and inspirational design solutions. Uh, that is one thing that I, I would like to see more of at the national conference is more engagement with the real estate industry, and we have the financial community here now, and with the building community, the developers. We have the planners, the public planners, but not the, the real estate folks who are going to be uh, building these things, and I think there's a lot to learn there from what they're doing. And engineers as well. I mean, one of the things that we were talking about in developing the California Adaptation Forum was how do we get the engineers here to learn more about for change in the, in the future as, as you know, climate change continues to become uh, a, more of a problem. Um, and I would love to see that at the National Adaptation Forum as well. I mean, part of the challenge is that in engineers are sometimes so separated from the policy world that the, the conversation is really difficult. So we talked about the need for a translation mechanism at the conference to, to figure out how we talk to each other. And so I think that's an emerging issue that, that we're going to have to deal with as all these policy folks that say, all right, we've dealt with climate change, we have policy. Uh, well, that's not that's not <laughs> dealing with climate change. And dealing with climate change is how that policy gets implemented, and the engineers are going to be deeply involved in that. And uh, I think we need to have them at the table so that we can all be on the same page about what what that policy really intends to do on the ground. Getting to that on the ground, someone has sent in a question asking if we can summarize what we see as the major obstacles slash issues related to implementation. Let me take a shot at that. I, I think that. The difficulty we have in the policy world that we live in is that, I'll just choose a number, 99% of the laws that we administer were enacted before anyone was thinking about climate change. And the fact that they those laws don't work 
and in some cases are obstacles to resilience, obstacles to adaptation, should not come as a surprise. And yet we are trying to use those laws and adapt them uh, to this changing world. So I think that's a, a major obstacle that we are all facing. We come up with good ideas, but we find they're illegal. Oh, that's a that's a good point, Will. I, you know, when it comes to legal frameworks, we've been talking about you know, historically legal frameworks are in, put put in place to deal with uh, stationary environments. Right. And um, moving forward, even with the drought, we've we've run into issues where we've had to uh, modify some things. For example, through the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, you know, providing some exemptions for more flexible management of water supply to accommodate the longer term drought, and uh, you know, I think it's going to be an issue that, that continues to come up. And that's been talked about quite a bit here as well. Um, there's been talk of rolling easements, uh, mm -hmm. and particularly, I mean, the Conservancy, Coastal Conservancy, has been talking about that for years as a possibility. Uh, funding, of course, continues to be at the top of the page on how do we actually get things done on the ground. And we're trying to um, provide some of the funding platforms out there. In California, we have robust legislation and funding capability around uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions, mm -hmm. uh, but we really don't have the same mechanisms in place uh, for adaptation and resilience at this point. Um, of course, part of, part of what we want to see is that resilience and adaptation is just put into decision making around all infrastructure and all proposals, um, so it's not something that's off to the side. Uh, and I'll give you one example with, with cap and trade expenditures. Uh, if your project is not resilient to the impacts of climate change and you're applying for money out of cap and trade revenue, you're not likely to get funded or be rated that highly in comparison to others that have dealt with the resilience question. So it's not a question of, you know, do we need to separately fund resilience? It, it's that it needs to be in everything and we need to figure out how to accommodate the additional cost of what dealing with resilience may, may result in, in in project proposals. Um, along the lines of the funding also, I think another interesting thing that's happening is there's so many people working on it, there's so many projects going on out there, and people really feel like they're being asked to do more with less, but what happens is we end up being in competition with each other. Even though where there's this spirit of collaboration, the spirit of figuring out how we work together, um, we're all competing for the same little buckets of money. And I think sometimes that isolates some of what, you know, could be much bigger, large-scale projects because, you know, we just have to do a better job of figuring out how we work together, how we really coordinate our actions, um, but in a way that we can actually get the work done. Because sometimes you have so many collaborators at the table, you've got a great project that will be amazing, but there's just so little money that all you can do is bring everyone together to talk about it. So I think we've got some, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussions that need to happen about how we really truly fund, how we prioritize, and um, not only how we make the decisions, but who makes the decisions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, um, so, and I, I think with um, uh, with uh, California, you know, we a number of our funding streams have a preference for regional coordination. One of the reasons are we acknowledge it's a lot more efficient when multiple jurisdictions are working together, particularly on the resilience and adaptation question, because no local government doing anything by themselves is going to be that effective on a resilience standpoint. Um, but work, folks working together can be much more efficient. I think we noticed a shift during during the stimulus, uh, during the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act through the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant funds. Um, people got together and, and started doing joint applications to support projects because they didn't have the staffing to support implementation um, for, by themselves. So they, they had to work with their neighboring jurisdictions to actually go in for those project proposals. And as a result of that, we have, we have a, a fair number of policy documents that are joint policy documents in the state. And it's really created an environment of collaboration that I don't think was there before. Mm -hmm. So the unintended consequence of, of an economic downturn is, is more efficient use of limited staff resources. Right, well, and perhaps one of the consequences of climate change is that we'll stop spending funding and people's time doing things that are vulnerable and get in that overarching evaluation of everything we do as we do it that says, wow, we could spend a lot of money not doing, we could save a lot of money not doing that thing that we'd have to spend money fixing later. Well, we are um, at the end of the time that we have allotted for this abbreviated webinar today. Any last thoughts that any of you want to share about uh, what you're hoping to see today at the forum, or uh, one more thing that you've remembered that you really liked? By moving forward from this forum, this is not meant to be the 
end of a conversation or a stationary conversation. This is meant to be the beginning of a longer term conversation with a practitioner network around the state in coordination with the national forum as well. So uh, following this, uh, a core group of, of leadership from the state is getting together to talk about next steps and to focus uh, some uh, essential energy on some core strategies moving forward. Um, and we'll Uh, likely having a public discourse at the National Adaptation Forum um, about how we're moving forward. And so we're, we're just really excited to be able to share uh, the knowledge that's been gained through this event um, with the National Adaptation Forum participants and, and learn more from what's going on around the rest of the U.S. so we can bring it back at the California Adaptation Forum in 2016. Um, just a, a quick reminder again, if you if you want resources related to this event, take a look at CaliforniaAdaptationForum.org, um, and the videos will be posted. And if you want to take a look at the plenary sessions today, they will be live streamed on the website um, and recorded for playback later. Yep, it's still bright and early here, so all of you folks on the East Coast have missed nothing yet today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the one thing that really stuck with me, I was in Amber's session that she talked about earlier. Um, I was one of the people sitting on the floor. and. <laughs> Um, there was, the discussion was about what does success look like, and, and the answer was it really depends upon who you talk to and what their values are, um, and I, that really stuck with me. Like it really is important to have this dialogue to figure out what our values are together, and I, and I think Bill or Will, I'm sorry, to your point about the national dialogue and you know what do you do with places that are different than California, um, you have to acknowledge their their values to some extent and, and understand what that means for success, and, and then translate the the value of what's happening here in California in a way that they can understand and maybe appreciate and, and buy off. And I guess that would be my sort of closing thought on, on thinking for a national forum. Well, I think California will do what California has always done. and It's uh, watch this spot, and that is we lead by example, and I'm very proud of what we're doing here today. Excellent. So more good stuff in the program. Um, I want to thank you all for spending some time with us before the opening morning plenary, which is 10 minutes away for us. Um, and I wanted to remind everyone who's listening that the next uh, National Adaptation Forum will be next May in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and the call for proposals um, opens up uh, in early September. So if you have a session idea, um, or you look through the California Adaptation Program and say, wow, that looked awesome. I want to expand that to a national level. Um, go for it and uh, get your submissions in. Uh, the, the process will be open for a month or so, and um, information is at the nationaladaptationforum.org website. Uh, so thank you all for listening. Um, this presentation was recorded. Um, you can listen to it and past climate uh, national adaptation forum webinars at the ecoadapt.org slash webinars uh, website. Um, and the next uh, webinar will be in November. So thank you all for listening. Thank you all for speaking today. Um, and go and do good adaptation work.